Level One Coaching Podcast. I'm Drew Carlson. Mikael Bryan will be the person that you hear next. And today we're going to kind of continue the conversation from the first two podcasts that we've had. They're kind of all blending together at this point. And we're going to quickly rehash the idea of high velocity people. We want to kind of hammer that today. And this principle that Mikhail brought up to me off air, and we're going to speak about that. So high velocity people for those that, again, I'll link that article if you're just hopping in for the first time, um, pause this. It's great uh, background context on kind of what we're doing here, what this platform's about, and what we've kind of dove into so far. Um, This high velocity people concept. So level one coaches are often the ones that are becoming the level 50s from what we've seen anecdotally people that we've worked with in the past and just kind of what we're observing from afar uh, and doing some research on some of these people that we'll hopefully have on in the future. Um, But this velocity concept that the ones are getting to 50 and the level 20s are kind of getting stuck. So the principle that we're going to get into is, and in trying to find some of these people early on, connect with them, attach yourself to them, build relationships, build friendships with them, you have to look for what is being said versus who is saying it. And I'll kick that over to Mikhail. It was something that he brought up. And we're going to kind of dive all the way down the rabbit hole on that today. So what comes to mind when uh, you were thinking about that? Yeah. So the way I sort of think about it or see it is, um, you know, when you're, when you're listening to, it doesn't really matter what forum you're listening, uh, a coach or really anyone speak, it's easy to, it's easy to listen to who's saying it and think because of who's saying it, they must know what they're talking about. Meaning if you are in the sports world and hockey, if you're listening to, um, you know, an NHL coach or an NHL analyst um, on one of the network, you know, post game or whatever, they must know what they're talking about because of their credential, et cetera. And it's not that they don't, and that could also be true or is true. Uh, but I think the way I look at it is like, instead of evaluating based on who's saying it, so sorry, there, there's that part. And then the inverse of that would be listening to, you know, like we talked about the level one, the, a tier three junior assistant. It's like, well, why would I listen to what he's saying? Because he doesn't have the weight behind his word that somebody who played in the NHL does. Um, it's very easy to do that. I think it's natural. I think to a certain degree, we all do it. We weigh more heavily the words of those that we consider to be experts and we definitely underway the words of those that we consider to just be novice or why would we listen to them? Cause we don't have any reason to yet. Um, my, you know, the way I think of it is like, it's, it takes intention to fight that instinct that we all have. And if you really listen to what is being said, then it opens your your mind up and it opens also like possibilities of learning to way more than just the people that you, you perceive you should weigh their word. So now anyone is fair game and you're paying attention to what are they saying? What are they talking about? Um, Do I, do I understand that? Do I think that could bring value to my team um, or to my coaching philosophy? And now you're, you're really just, judging and judging is maybe a bad word, but you're really, um, you're really just weighing what is being said. And that's how you allocate whether or not you want to take it and and run with it, or you want to take it and throw it away. And when you start doing that, I think what you sometimes find or what I found is that now you're some of the people that before you were like, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to what he says. Um, I'm going to really like, take that to heart, you're like, I don't, I don't know if I actually agree with that. And at first it feels like it's like an instinctual reaction that you're like, how could I not agree with that? He definitely knows what he's saying, but you start to like really break it down in your mind. You're like, I just don't, I just don't know if I see it that way. 
And then you start to come across maybe other people that you probably wouldn't have listened to in the first place, or maybe you just wouldn't have um, been as open to their ideas. And you start thinking like, that's a, that's a pretty good, I like that. I like that kind of thought process, or I like that um, where that person's going with that, or that coach is going with that. And so now it, it kind of just goes back to that idea that like your, your possibilities for where you get ideas from and who you listen to or who you um, try to learn from is open to a, a much greater degree than it was before. Yeah, it reminds me, and you're going this weekend, but we talked about off air, whether it's the Naples conference, whether it's name a conference that hockey coaches or coaches or just people from any specific field go to, um, you're getting inputs and you're listening to speakers that typically have the logo already. They're, they have what's what I call in the first book, like a credibility stamp. And that term comes from, it's not mine. It comes from Naval Ravikant. So, uh, homage to their credit to where credit's due. Um, but anyway, like they have this credibility stamp and that kind of opens us up to this trap where we're going to feverishly take notes because we're listening to an AHL head coach this weekend, or we're listening to an NHL head coach this weekend, or like Scotty Bowman's going to be there um, at Naples for you guys. And like, not that you shouldn't take stock in Scotty Bowman, but um, the trap is that there's this credibility stamp. There's this perceived level of expertise and we should, or not that we should, but typically how hockey has kind of gone as an industry is that we are copycats. And I think, and you agree that we should completely get away from that and embrace your own edge. And like, we can talk on a different episode about that, but this credibility stamp is what opens you up to falling into this trap. And um, I was just listening to a podcast by Brett Bartholomew. And one of his quotes that he's used multiple times is excellence is self-evident. And so is bullshit. And then I was thinking about that as you and I were exchanging messages this week talking about this episode and I started thinking about it and then I added on to it. So let me kick it back to you. This is my addition. So excellence is self-evident and so is bullshit, but the logo clouds it. Where does that kind of take you? Yeah, I think that's, that's sort of, that's exactly what's being said versus who's saying it because it's, um, the, like you, you refer to it as the logo. I think you could also, I guess what was coming to mind for me too, was like the, like watching the post game shows and right now on the playoffs in the NHL, like, um, that, that kind of stuff, it's like the logos there, they're NHL, former NHL players or guys that have been doing this a long time. Like some of that, and I'm not saying all of them are, aren't worth listening to some of the stuff like you're saying with Scotty Bowman is like, yeah, it's pretty spot on. I like that. But there are other times where you watch it or you hear it and you're like, I don't, I just don't know if I saw the same thing. Um, but there's a, there's a, I just think like a natural instinctual reaction within ourselves to be like, but that logo is telling me otherwise. That logo tells me he does know what he's saying or that the fact that he's on TV and I'm not, or this other guy that I know who I like isn't like, he must know what he's talking about because why else would he be there? And you kind of assume that like that status equals all knowing insight or, you know, all encompassing knowledge. And it's, it's not, it's not to say that they don't have value. They don't see things that are whatever, but that's not necessarily always 100% true that that's the case. And when you operate in that world where it's just, you know, if you have the correct logo or you have the correct stamp, of credibility, then I'm going to listen. And if you don't, then I'm not. You've, you've just shut out so many possibilities for yourself, um, for your team. Like it, I can't, there's a million negative consequences of that um, because you are going to be closed minded to a lot that you probably could learn from. Um, and 
I always think of like uh, one of the guys I worked for used to always say innovation comes from necessity. And I think of it like a lot of times, I think that's true first and foremost. And a lot of times those that quote have the necessity to be innovative are not wearing that logo that's stamped with credibility right now because they're trying to make it. And so a lot of times those innovative ideas, those those new things that maybe haven't made their way to the mainstream yet, they're on the fringes. They don't exist necessarily in the, you know, everyday common talking points that are brought up in, in playoff discussion or coaching discussions, um, seminars, stuff like that. They're kind of, they're the sidebars. They're the things that are going on on the fringes, like I said. So I think that's where if you're, if you're shut, if you're only going to go, and listen to the keynote speaker and nobody else, then you just shut the possibility out of you learning from maybe some innovative fringe type people or ideas. Um, and I, I look at it like, why would you want to do that to yourself to, I mean, just, just to yourself really, but even to your staff, like whoever you work with your team, like it's not, that's not the most, effective way i think to to learn and to be productive even yeah and like the hypocrisy that we get into as coaches too is and i i forget which popular fucking new york bestseller it's from but like the best idea wins is one of the sound bites that gets regurgitated and recycled and you know the best idea wins here but a lot of people and we talked about how the level 50s are and that's what sets them apart but there's a lot of level 20 coaches in high level hockey, relevant levels of hockey that do have an obligation, hopefully to upskill their staff and educate their staff and continue to develop their assistants. So one day they can maybe take their job or take another job and move on, move up, move out, like we've talked about. And if you're not looking for the best ideas, if you're just simply looking for ideas that are coming from credibility stamps, those might not be the best ideas out there and they might be coming from the fringes. And that kind of gets into, um, speaking of the fringes, like we, that brings up for me, like the Tony Holler thing that we talked about off air. And there are division one level sprint coaches 10, 15 years ago when this guy was coming onto the scene that would laugh if anyone brought up Tony Holler because he's just some, he lives in the middle of America. Like he's a middle school science teacher and he was completely underground, but he was just open sourcing everything that he was trying, experimenting with and just putting it out online. And eventually there was a level 50 coach with some clout out there that found him, tapped into it, started studying it and was like, holy shit, like this guy is onto something. And then he told one person and then they told two people and then they told four people. And now, like today, you can talk to anyone in strength and conditioning and everyone knows who Tony Holler is. And it just takes that one person, that logic, that Chris Webby, to pull a guy up because of his ideas, not because of where he is. No one in the level 20 sector is looking for a middle school track coach and science teacher for ideas on how to be a great sprinter. And yet one of the fifties will go looking for that and they're rewarded and they have a head start and an edge and first mover advantage on everyone else because everyone else is looking down on that person and saying, he's a middle school science teacher. What can I learn from that guy? Yeah. And that's exactly why you should be listening to what's being said because that was kind of my other point we were talking yesterday. Like if you are listening to what's being said, you're going to find the Tony Holler type people who I honestly had never even heard of him until you brought him up last week. But um, you are going to find those type of people, those types of people very early. And you will not have to wait until Tony Holler is a world renowned coach. And now everyone wants a piece of him. Everyone wants to get, a question in or get a little bit of advice from him. He doesn't have time to do that necessarily. So if you can get on his radar or you can open yourself up to learning from him before he is the entity that he is now, you have, you call the first mover advantage. I, I 
it's exactly that. I look at it like you just have the benefit of learning uh, something new that could change the way you do things before anyone else knows about it. And they're like, how do you, you can't, you can't, you literally can't quantify the value that that could bring to your career or your team. Um, you're getting exposed to a different way of doing things in real time versus lagged by five, 10 years when everyone else is already doing it now. So there's no more competitive advantage. Um, you know, within, within like hockey coaching, things i think of like how certain um how certain teams recruit and like whether it's recruiting their player like certain types of players or from certain leagues like if if you wait until you see another college have really good success recruiting from this league and then you try to go tap into it like you're late but that league might have been reaching out to you. I mean, there are certainly within like division three landscape, there are leagues that are, they're not all equal. Some are better than others. And some of the ones that aren't considered as good, a lot of teams just look down on and won't go touch. They won't go look at the league. They won't see if there's any players there for them. Um, some of the best players in college come from leagues like that in division three. Um, and they probably were always good enough to play at the college level, but only a certain subset of schools were willing to look at them. And it's how you get kind of like what we consider like, oh, this is like so random. This kid like did so well. It's like, no, he's always been doing well. But it's just that like half of the half of the intended audience didn't want to pay attention to him. Um, and the point being is like now if you see that success story and you're like, all right, I got to go look at that league too. Well, you're not the only one that saw it. There's a bunch of other coaches and teams that saw it too. And now you're competing in the same landscape, but you're late to it. And if you would have been open to it in the beginning, just because of kind of going back to like what's being said, like being open to that because you're at the division three level, you got to find a competitive advantage, whatever, whatever reason that you could have been open to and it weren't, you weren't open to it. You don't get to tap into it until it's already common. And you kind of lost out on that first mover advantage um, in the in the way that we're talking about this from more of a personal development standpoint, like don't lose that person or don't lose that first mover advantage. Like if you're paying attention to what's being said and not just who's saying it, you're going to you're you're not going to be missed um, and you're not going to miss the guys that are or girls that are saying things that you you think have value and that you could potentially learn from and take to your your development or your team? Yeah. And we kind of have, like, we can, obviously it's our platform and we're telling personal stories and observations from what we see outside. Two things come to mind. The first one we were talking about yesterday, just like on the personal side, and we can get into this for a bit, but like for, I'm going to kick it to you first because mm -hmm. it like, I think people will see it more without like reading between the lines and they they're probably going to come to the wrong conclusion, but it's easy to see why I might be doing, we decided to do a podcast three weeks ago and I said, Hey, Mikhail, do you want to do this? And he was like, yeah, sure. Here we go. And now here we are. And it might be easy knowing that I'm a former tier three junior hockey coach that has been out of coaching for going on my third year now building this platform waiting for a fit attracting the right people to me going about it slightly different but currently i'm out of the game and the highest level that i've coached is in the usphl um so maybe it's easy to see why i attached to mikhail but from like a level 50 perspective even though you might not be there yet you're that mindset why are you on a fucking podcast with me <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this, like, I think it was yesterday, like, mm -hmm. because I, that's sort of, it goes back to that exact point. Like if I'm not looking for just who's saying it, if I'm looking for, sorry, if I'm looking for just who's saying something, then I'm going to look at what you're saying and be like, well, I don't need to listen to Drew and his nonsense. But 
I, it's not even like I intentionally set out to do that. I just like, and I don't know, probably just like my whole life growing up, I was always like kind of ingrained, like just listen to what's being said, listen for the content. And if you resonate with the content then like, who's that person? Should you learn from them, talk to them, whatever. And there were, there were plenty of things that you had either written about or talked about that I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I see it the same way. Um, and, or I didn't, but I at least saw the value in what you're saying. Like maybe there were things we didn't agree on, which we, we talked about too. Like, um, and so for me, it was like doing this was not about any like benefit I'm going to get from you. It was just about like, all right, we can, there's two people that have talked about a lot of stuff just on their own time. And if we can like bring some of this to the surface and, and kind of attract other like-minded individuals or people that want to have conversations about this as well, then there's value in that regardless of whether that means that you have a job in hockey that's super attractive or you have a job in hockey that's totally unattractive. Like I, I don't, I mean, I think I joked with you yesterday, like, yeah, sure. It'd be it, like, it'd be easy for me to not easy, but it, I understand if someone would be like, Oh, I want to start a podcast. Like, let me call up some NHL head coach, start a podcast with them. Like that's not going to work. And I don't know if he's going to really want to riff on these things the way that you do and have the same perspective that you do. So like, there's no value. There's great value in like attaching myself to some NHL logo and an NHL team, but is there any value in the conversation that not only for us that we'll have, but like for people who listen, um, are they going to get any value out of that? Like maybe not. Okay. Then what's the point of that? And so I look at this as like, it doesn't matter where you coach. It doesn't even matter where I coach. The The point is what we're talking about. And that's the whole point of this episode. It's like, what is being said? So that for me was like, that's all, that's all that mattered to me. It was what we were talking about you could have been from Mars uh, and I could have been, you know, from Mars too. Like it, what mattered is what we were talking about and, and whether or not that had value and made sense. Not so much like who am I today and where am I today and where are you today? And like, are you going to bring me anything right now? Yeah, it's, I, and we've, I've written about this and I can link some stuff, but it's essentially like when you're looking for high velocity people and you're, at level one, you're really just looking for your people. Because if you're resonant with like, if I'm resonant with how driven Mikhail is, um, the levels of thinking and the depth that we can get to on conversations, which is why I wanted to do this with him. Um, it's not because he was like, some of you might be thinking, well, he's ahead of you. He's a division three assistant, like he might get you a job one day, of course, like you're out of the game. But if you're looking for your people and resonating on what is being said, and even if you're looking for people at level one, two, to come up with, um, like that is kind of the point of this and where we're going. And what comes to mind is like, I should have looked this up, but like, it was like five years ago, um, Brandon Narada was on like the hockey think tank and I was coaching in my first year of juniors. So I was just like starting to get to know some people and I would bring up because I resonated a lot with what he was saying. And he was talking about stuff that was unheard of at the time, like inverted rushes, um, just things that were cuckoo crazy five years ago um, that are now just like pretty mainstream and everyone's talking about it. But, at the time I would talk to people and they'd be like, I don't know, like about him. I don't, I don't know. Like he's doing it with Michigan high school players at TPH, but like, would it work? Some, would it work at Michigan? Which like, we didn't know that's where he was headed, but that's where he is now. Um, but that was like the argument I would hear from people. And it's kind of falling into that trap that he was just like this guy working at this startup company that he started and he didn't have the, logo of Michigan or the Red Wings where he's worked behind him yet. And people get skeptical and people tune you out and people check out on your messaging and they're like, yeah, and they doubt you. And then all of a sudden when you like to do the resulting thing, like if you make it, whether it's through that or on your own merit, 
which I think in his case it was that. But, like, when you make it, then everyone goes, okay, inverted rushes. But, like, you could have been studying that, iterating on that, trying stuff that he was saying that you were like, let me wait and see if it works at D1. Let me see if it works in the NHL. And then all of a sudden you're 10 years behind when you could have started. Um, I don't know if that brings any thoughts to you. I'll volley that over. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly, that's like a good uh, actual example of someone who was on the fringe was talking about things that weren't probably popular or mainstream and some people gravitated to them. Some people didn't. Those that did, they probably were able to use some of the things he was talking about for the last 10 years before now. It's very popular and mainstream. And I mean, I know Michigan didn't win the national championship, but they were certainly entertaining to watch and played extremely, I mean, what I would consider extremely good overall hockey. Like, as far as I know, they didn't, again, didn't win, but you're talking about being one of the final four teams playing. That's hard enough to do in and of itself. Um, and so now to take some of those things that maybe Michigan is doing, like y- you, you certainly can do that, but everyone knows, everyone has the ability to know what Michigan is doing today. It is so out there in the open. Um, not everyone had the ability to know what he was doing, Narado was doing 10 years ago. 12 years ago, whatever it might be, Um, which kind of gets me into like, or makes me think of like, how do you, how do you know what to listen for? And what are you like, what are your filtering mechanisms to figure out? Like, is this person saying things that I like or that I think have value or not? Um, And which is like, to me, the way I, I, I look at that as like, you're I'm not necessarily I know I brought up like the post game um, analysis for NHL playoffs and there's some of that but even that um, that's still really short form we're still talking 30 45 seconds before we got to kick it over to the other guy Um, and I'm not necessarily talking like the in between the in between the um, TV timeout interviews they do in the NHL like again that's for all the coaches out there, like think about during a two minute TV timeout, do you really want to do an interview? Probably not. Um, so like those little sound bites that are given, I'm not sure I would put all my weight on judging or valuing what, what someone said, evaluating what someone says in that moment. Oh, clearly I'm biased here. We're doing a podcast. I think podcasts have a lot of value because it's totally open forum. Like, you can answer for 35 seconds or you can answer for 15 minutes. Um, and when you're looking at what's being said, at least what I do, and, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, like I'm usually evaluating for like a thought process. I'm trying to figure out like you call it levels to thinking, like which I had never really heard of before you brought that up. But I I look at it or I always thought of it as like, how much of their thought process on this is like solidified and how deep are they going with this thing? So like if you are listening to just cause we're talking about Narado, like if you're listening to him 10 years ago on the hockey think tank podcast and he just says inverted rushes and then he's like, yeah, that's what we do. And they're like, Oh, what is that? And he's like, yeah, it's this thing about rushes. And like, he doesn't really get into it. Well, like, I don't, I, I'm going to, I'm going to look at him and I'm going to be like, I don't, I just didn't, I don't understand. Like you didn't give me an explanation of what that is. So I can't really tell if what you're saying has value on the flip side. If he explains inverted rushes and then he's like, yeah, so this is like, this is what it looks like. This is how we coach it. These are the triggers or the cues that we want our players to recognize. And these are the scenarios where it's great. These are scenarios where it's definitely not great. And he starts getting into all these like, nuance and detail and explanation of of how they do it and how he teaches it and the different ways to teach it like all right this guy has some clearly well thought out processes to how he does this and if he's doing that for one thing that's relatively small within the whole game he's probably got this 
you know, multiplied out by however many other principles he's teaching or things he believes in. That's kind of like, at least for me, the cues I'm looking for is like, how well can they explain this and how thought out is this process? Um, I think when you, when you hear it, you kind of, you know, you're like, all right, he's like, he's going pretty deep in this. It sounds like there's more that he, he could even say if, if time allowed, or if he feels like it, um, and you're, and you leave with like a decent understanding where you could write down like two or three notes and go explain it to someone else and be like, this is, this is what I just learned versus that first iteration I gave of like, if Narada was just like, yeah, it's an inverted rush is just like what we do. And then you're like, all right, what is that? And he's like, oh yeah, it's just like this way of playing. And, and he doesn't get into any of it. Now I can go repeat inverted rushes to someone, <laughs> but I have no idea what it really looks like. Um, so that, that's how I guess I am trying to evaluate whether like what is being said has value, but I'm curious for you how you do that. Yeah, that's a good question. While you were talking, I just off the top of my head um, wrote down like three words and I can get into them, but I'm looking for... And one of them overlaps depth, difference, and conviction. So like you hit on depth pretty well. Um, the only thing that I would add to it is, and for younger coaches listening, uh, be mindful of this. So we've all listened to podcasts where there has been a 10 minute answer, but the 10 minute answer has said a lot of things without saying anything. Um, so that would be the only like additional filter I would add to depth. Like there are coaches that are great talkers. They can talk to you in recruiting all day. They can talk to you about their tactics all day and they can answer questions on podcasts all day. But like part of the depth isn't length. And I think that's where we could maybe get misconstrued for the listener. So like, don't think of it, younger coaches listening to this, don't think of it depth as like, you can go on all day about it it's like, what, again, what is being said? So kind of filter that, but like you hit on depth, knocked it out of the park. Um, difference is the second one. So a lot of where I've changed my mind on, on things in the last, call it three years, when I've been doing a lot of writing, a lot of reflection, um, and a lot of iterating on what I'm going to do in my next job, um, has come from hearing things that are completely different so if i'm listening to that and i was at the time like he brought up inverted rushes and i'm like i don't even know that like grab a dictionary like what is that <laughs> um you'd have to grab a hockey dictionary and it probably wasn't even written in a hockey dictionary yet because it was so new so like when something that you haven't heard of before or just something that if you're super convicted and i've been on the complete left of an argument and someone throws something on the internet from the complete right, like I will with intention purposely click on it and read it. And hearing that like polar opposite, it might not bring you all the way over to the other side, but it brings you to the middle. And then you can start to think, how can I build on this from the middle? And what nuances can I add? What can I take out? Where can I change this? And you can start like playing in this area where here you were stuck and here they're kind of stuck. But if they can move you, then like there's some flow in the middle. Um, so I think about difference a lot. And then conviction. Like there are people that can talk and they can render cliches and press conference sound bites and um, again, say things without saying anything. And then there are people that if you can go, Sam Hinkie talks about like how far, like I'll ask someone a question that they want to talk about on a topic they want to talk about. And I want to know how far down the rabbit hole they can go. And he's like, I will go all the way down until I start hearing press conference sound bites, cliches, bullshit. And then I'm like, okay, we're done. That's to the level that you know this. And with some people you can ask them, one question on something that they think they know really well, or they want to talk about. And right off the bat, it's this pre-programmed press conference soundbite. And you're like, this person doesn't know that. So I look for that as well. That might be useful um, for you 
if you have any thoughts on any of that, if you want to add on. Yeah. No, I like the, uh, I like the difference piece a lot because to me, that's like, that's where most, I don't want to say all the right answers, but most of the truth lies closer to the middle, like you were saying, Mm -hmm. than it does on the two extremes. And so the natural tendency is to hear the total opposite of whatever you view. So you said you're on the far left and you hear the far right perspective. And before you even really get through the far right perspective, you're like, yeah, I don't like this. I'm done with it. And you put Mm -hmm. it away. And a lot of times, like, I think the, the truth or the best answer is, is somewhere in that middle ground. And in a lot of ways, like your job as a coach or just as like a learner should be, excuse me, to be looking at the opposite perspective and trying to figure out if that complete other side, which you don't really fundamentally believe in has any merit. Uh, Because if it does, it doesn't mean that you should go do it, but it maybe means that you should move a little bit away from this, the staunch position you are in. Um, And I, and I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good, like, technical example i guess one that i'm thinking of could be like we you know i believe that our our defensemen should be up in the rush every single time they're on the ice both guys at all times and i'm a hardcore believer in that well i might want to listen to some people who believe in the complete opposite that are like i believe our d should sit back and only take a rush never jump up in the play and essentially just be pinned to the blue line at all times, defensive blue line. And it's obvious when I'm saying this out loud, like, well, if you're doing what I'm saying, you're going to end up with probably a good amount of breakaways against and a lot of odd man rushes against because you're always going to have 2D up in the play, even when it's not a great time to jump. And if you're doing the opposite, you might never give up an odd man rush, but you also might never earn an odd man rush. And you're going to be playing the whole entire game three on four, three on five. Um, the, the best answer probably lies in the middle, which maybe looks like teaching your D what are some good cues to jump up in the rush right now? What are some good cues to not jump up in the rush right now? What are some key game scenarios where I should be jumping up because we're down a goal or, Hey, we're up a goal with a minute left. The last thing I need you doing is thinking about jumping up in the play right now. That's probably more where you want to live in and where you want to get to than either of the extremes. But I think this is even more a problem in today's society than in the past. But it is very difficult to listen to the, call it opposition, or the opposite perspective. And we want to, you know, obviously, we like the perspective that we agree with more. That's natural. But it doesn't mean that you shut out the other. And sometimes like sometimes the best learning you can do and the most um call it like influential things that you can come across are from the complete opposite perspective of the one that you hold and it forces you to see things in a different light and um i was just i was just reading something on this actually that was and i don't remember where i was reading it but like if if I have a hardcore belief one way and you have a hardcore belief the other way, like one of us is probably wrong. So don't we want to hash it out to figure out who instead of me just saying, I don't want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So if you're a hardcore believer in 2D up in the rush all the time and someone else is a hardcore believer in 2D back all the time, like one of you has to be not wrong, but one of you has to have more merit than the other. There's got to be something that could budge one of you towards each other and come up with a, all right, you know what? This is a good solution that we can both agree on. And too often, I think we're just like, well, he's just crazy and I'm right. And you, and then he thinks you're crazy and he's right. And so you never get anywhere. And neither of you learn from each other. Neither of you get any sort of perspective on, on the other person's position. And we just shut that person out. And now for the next five years, I'm never going to listen to a thing that guy says because I think he's an idiot. And it's like, what if you just had a 
thoughtful disagreement for a little bit. So when you're talking about what you're listening for, um, difference is one that I did not think of, but I, I absolutely love because it, it is difficult to be different or to think differently. And it is something that if you're able to identify like, Hey, this, this person's thinking about this a little differently, definitely worth considering, even if you don't end up agreeing with it or doing anything with it. Yeah. To me, it's just where, as you were talking about it and I kind of had like a picture of what I was trying to say. Um, but then you were talking through those two situations. It's like, this is the example of jumping up in the rush all the time with two or not at all. And when you're at a one and a 10, like you have your hard and fast rules and there's not like a lot of, it's just red light, green light. There's not a lot of thinking and where you can start to one challenge yourself to eventually make your team better, make your staff better, start to think for yourself is coming to the middle because that's where the questioning starts. Okay. When is a good time to go with how many in what situations with how much time on the clock with the score. And then all of a sudden now you're thinking, okay, this is what we're going to do in this situation. This is what we're going to do in this situation. This is how it differs. And now all of a sudden you have a thought process and you're starting to think through some of these different situations. And it's not just your example. It can, you can apply this widely to anything, um, pick a topic, but I'm just trying to build off Mikhail's here. Um, but like the middle is where you're going to start thinking. And then if you're sitting at a five and you're thinking, and then maybe with some of your thoughts and the context, you kick yourself to a six. So you're a little bit closer to where you started. You're a little more convicted in it, but at least now you like know why, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. You know why. And then the other one that just came to me is like, you, you also know the merit behind it because you considered the opposite. And so conviction follows because now when I ask you, say you, you, to just continue with this example, say you are a hardcore believer that the defenseman should never jump up in the rush. And I ask you, but you considered my perspective of how they always should jump up. You still end up, you, you brought yourself to a five, but you still end up going back to a six and you finish at a seven. Now, when I, when someone else asks you like, well, why, why do you believe that the D should never jump up in the rush? You've already gone through the thought process of, why I maybe wouldn't want my D to do this. And I've considered Mikel's point of view or whoever's point of view, and I'm still back at where I started or I'm closer to where I started than where they are. And so now your conviction is even higher because you've thought out the, the other side, the anti goals, if you want to call it of, of that. So it's like, it's, it's a great exercise to undergo in really any circumstances because all you're going to end up with is a better understanding of why you sit where you sit. And on top of that, more conviction in being there because you've considered the other side and you still end up where you end up. And, and maybe, maybe you don't, that could be the other possibility is you go through this, you started at a 10, you brought yourself to a five and you finish at a four. You're like, you know what? You're right. I actually think that I should live more in the world that you're talking about than the one I was. And now again, you've got more conviction to live in that world because you can, you, you used to not. (laughs) So you understand why this has merit. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons that people who make hardcore changes. um, And I'm trying to think of a good example of that, but maybe like in the political world, someone who goes from being a hardcore uh, Republican to a hardcore Democrat, like, or, you know, even you could use like an addiction example, someone who is an, an addict of any sort of drug or alcohol and goes completely sober. I think those opinions sometimes have so much merit. And I, at least I find myself very interested in what they have to say specifically because they've lived in both worlds. They've lived in the, the very progressive world. They've lived in the very conservative world. They've lived in the hard, addiction world and they've lived in the now hard sober world um those are such different worlds to exist in and most of us 
don't ever do that. Most of us live in one or in the middle all the time. So to have lived and survived in both, I think the things that you, that person is going to bring to the table, that, that level of conviction and belief that they have, it, it like rubs off on you. Cause you're like, how could I not believe in what they're saying when they've, they've seen it firsthand from both sides. Yep. And that kind of building on top of that again, um, it gives you like we talk about and we talked about in the article, like perspective taking just as a mental model, but then instead of just using a mental model, now you have lived experiences in both instead of, I believe this, I can go ahead and like, give Mikhail the benefit of the doubt here. I'll throw him a bone. I'll see it from his perspective. That's like, that's level one. And then like further in that game, if you have lived experience on both sides, like that's going to be incredibly, again, to your point, like incredibly more powerful. If you have someone that's been sober and been addicted, they're going to have a greater depth, breadth of experience. And like, then that might be someone, again, kind of going back full circle, what's being said versus who's saying it. If you have people that have way more perspectives through lived experience, that's going to hold more weight than just kind of doing this mental model in your head. And sometimes if you're sitting here and you're a 22 year old coach, like you don't have a ton of lived experience in say this career field. Um, so I'm not saying avoid the mental model, but if you have both, if you have lived experience, like lean into and tap into that more. And then if you don't, you can use this mental model. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, and if you don't, if you don't have, if you're a younger coach that hasn't had the opportunity to do both necessarily, um, then find people who have, and you can learn from them. And it's why I think like, you know, within the coaching world, that's why I think like sometimes there's maybe some hesitation um, when you look at like coaches that are making a jump from division three to division one or like junior hockey to division one, cause it's like, well, it's a different level or, or even, uh, division one to the NHL. It's like, well, it's a different level. They don't, they don't know it. Like I honestly look at that. It's like, I think someone who, if you can, if you're winning at the division one level and you're doing a, a great job, like the NHL level, it, it is different, but in a lot of ways, division one the challenges you have are a little bit more difficult to overcome. Like you can't change facilities are a huge thing right now in college sports. Like a division one coach can't change the facilities they operate in, at least not in the short term. So if they're finding a way to win despite that, then don't you think they could go coach in the NHL and have MSG or whatever ranked United center and be able to find success there? Um, same thing with, with junior hockey, like, well, they haven't worked in division one, whatever, like if you can coach your team to a successful season over the course of 60 games and 12 hour bus trips, I think you could probably figure it out in division one. Um, and, and same thing I'm biased of course, but I do think it exists in division three too. Like there's a lot of different things. I'll just talk as a head coach, as a head coach in division three, I'm obviously not one, but I see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Like there's a lot of challenges that all head coaches in division three have from secondary responsibilities to um, the normal responsibilities of a coach. Also, whatever challenges the individual school that you're at has, like there's a lot that they have to balance all the time on their plate. And depending on where the division three head coaches, he might only have a part-time assistant. So now even more is on his plate. Um, if they're able to do that well, and succeed at a, to think that they couldn't do it at a division one school because they haven't coached at the level like okay but now at the division one level you've got two to three assistants plus hockey operations plus volunteer staff and the budget increases by a million <laughs> like i don't even know what what increase that would be like it's crazy to think that you couldn't succeed so i think uh, that's a little side tangent but um it is definitely it's definitely a scenario where i look at like 
it's easy to it's easy to say like well you got to have the requisite experience at our level to do well at our level in reality challenges exist everywhere and the higher up you go either the less challenges there are or the more nuanced the challenges are and at the lower levels the more challenges there are and the more broad those challenges are so if you're combating them at the lower levels and succeeding you're going to still have to learn as you climb but you're going to be able to figure those out because you figured out the hardest um, already so that's a totally off topic no, that, tangent gonna, but no i have i have so many thoughts on that um we're gonna wrap there because of it and obviously we've been if you haven't listened to episode one these are all seemingly building on top of each other and episode four uh i got an idea for that so we'll wrap up here we will sign off for now and we will with episode four